The next case we're going to consider is our infinite line charge. So to be consistent with how we looked at it before, let's say that this infinite line charge is along the z-axis and it has uniform charge density rho sub l. So we want to figure out what is d at some arbitrary point p. And so what we want to define first is what type of Gaussian surface should we use? So what is our Gaussian surface? And so maybe go ahead and pause the video and think about that for a second and see if you can't figure it out. So remember, we want our D to be constant on our Gaussian surface, and we also want our D to be normal or tangential. Okay, so we, we kind of need to know a little bit something about D. So let's think sort of qualitatively about what's going on with our electric field and therefore our D from this infinite line charge. So if we think about it in terms of a bunch of point charges sort of all together, what we can say is similar to what we did when we first talked about our infinite sheet of charge is if we have some charge here, that's going to be creating an electric field roughly in this direction but we're going to have some sort of counter charge, which is going to be here, and it's going to create an electric field in this direction. And so the end result, of course, is that the upward part of this force is going to counteract the downward part of this one, such that these two forces here are going to add together to get a net force that is away from the line charge, or a net electric field, I should say. And so what we could think of is for every point on the line charge, there's going to be a corresponding point, sort of equidistance from P in the opposite direction, and our total net electric field and D is going to be in our rho direction, or it's going to be directed perpendicularly away from our, um, from our line charge. So with that in mind, what we want to do is to define something with some constant rho, and so if we think about a constant rho, of course, that's going to give us a cylinder. So we can define a Gaussian surface that is a cylinder which goes through P. Um, so again, I'm going to do my best to draw this, but kind of use your imagination or your visualization to fill in any gaps in my inability to draw. Okay, so we've got some Gaussian surface, which is a cylinder, and on the surface of this Gaussian surface is our point P. All right, so we now have sort of three surfaces within this surface. We have our sort of outer wall, which is where P is, and then we have our top and our bottom. So of course we're going to have some DS for each of these. So we have a DS, and let me just say top, we have a DS on the bottom, and then we have a DS on the sides. Okay, so now remember though we said our d based on sort of our qualitative argument is going to be equal to d rho so it's only going to have a rho component and so what that means is for our top and bottom when we do the dot product of our rho vector with either our positive z vector or our negative z vector uh, sorry positive or negative unit vector in the z direction we're going to end up with our flux is zero so for the top and bottom we can say that our d dot ds is equal to zero. So then we only really need to consider our sides. So now let's say that this cylinder is enclosing some arbitrary length. So let's say from the top to the bottom of our cylinder is some arbitrary length L. Okay, and so what we can do then is we can go ahead and set up our, our integral because we needed to know L to figure out the total charge enclosed. So of course our total charge enclosed Q is going to be equal to our charge density rho L times the length of that infinite charge that is uh, enclosed. So we have rho L times L as our charge enclosed. But remember from Gauss's law, we said that our total charge enclosed is also equal to the closed surface integral of D dot DS. And again, we would have three terms, but for our top and bottom, that d dot ds is zero. So we're left with just our side term, and we can pull out the d rho, because remember, by design, our d rho, or sorry, our d in general should be constant along the Gaussian surface. 
So we pull that out and we're left with the integral on z and on phi. So our z is going from some arbitrary length or some arbitrary point L prime to some arbitrary uh, point L prime plus L. And our phi is going from zero to two pi, so we're rotating all the way around. And then our ds is going to be our ds for the row direction. So we have rho d phi dz. So all of that is our ds. And so that's pretty straightforward to evaluate. And we get that q is equal to d rho 2 pi rho l. All right. And then from there, we can say that our d is equal to rho l divided by 2 pi rho in our row direction. And again, remember that this row direction and this row distance can be locally defined. So with how we've defined this infinite line charge along the z-axis, it actually corresponds to our row for our cylindrical coordinates. But in general, that's just the perpendicular distance or the perpendicular direction from our line charge. And so we can compare this to the expression for our electric field that we had on page 412. And so remember for our electric field, we actually considered a finite line charge. We had to go through a lot of messy calculus and trigonometry. And ultimately we said, well, let's make sort of an approximation to arrive at what we got relatively easy here using Gauss's law.